Thank you so much for joining us on Heroes Welcome Podcast. Uh, my name is Maria Lacare Diego, marriage and family therapist, registered play therapist, supervisor. I'm joined today with my co-host. And that's me, Liliana Balan. I'm LMFT and RPTS. And we are here with the Marshall. incredible Marshall Lyle. Thanks Thank for having me. Good to see you both. Good to see you. Good to see you. I know we get to hang out uh, at length this June, um, but we're really excited to kind of start our conversation with you this morning. Yeah, I'm excited. I'm really honored to get to work with you two on that upcoming project and can't wait to see what unfolds in this dialogue. <laughs> chaos chaos is going to <laughs> rain for the next 30 minutes so buckle up <laughs> that's exactly it get ready to go on the ro roller coaster <laughs> so, so where how do we start marshall yes well i was loving hearing you all tell me about this podcast and and your vision for it and talking about the things that are often uncomfortable or overlooked or even to be honest unwelcome in the greater field of mental health, um, and not, not just mental health, even healthcare. Um, if we just keep looking at, at the systems that hold all of us. And um, it, it's always interesting to me still, um, these years into it, when I'm entering into a conversation where I know we're gonna talk about disability, I, I feel equal parts eager, uh, it feels important. And yet I was very much trained into covering it up and so my nervous system goes into um, a little bit of a, a, a minor meltdown of trying to figure out, is this still a good idea? Is this safe? Um, right. people really one, want to know? one foot on the brake and then you're still like revving the engine anyway. <laughs> it is. I mean, we, we all have learned to cover up so much to keep other people comfortable or to be able to, you know, keep our spot in the field. Uh, by not being too fill in the blank. Uh, and, and so it, it does always feel like there's a bit of a sense of risk to go to the next place of honesty and vulnerability about the lived experience of, of having uh, any of a number of, of different ways to be disabled uh, within this practice that we have. Yeah, absolutely. And that that is a lot of what, you know, Liliana and I started this was like, we keep having these conversations on the side. Um, and they're conversations that need to be, you know, we need to move away from doing just like pleasantries, right? Like, how are you? I'm great. How's the weather? Uh, we we can move beyond that. Um, but yeah, there is a lot of risk uh, in putting yourself out there, but also it's very vulnerable for your own clinical practice if you are seen as unwell. Yeah. Yeah. And, and even um, uh, labels around things being unethical you know, for having a different kind of need or having to create a different kind of schedule or your kind of best practices maybe don't match, you know, what um, other bodies and minds might be able to to move through. And uh, and so you do start to feel sheepish, sheepish and shameful uh, about needing to exist different while at the same time, um, uh oh, I'm already going into honesty. It, it's yeah. already on. Are we ready? Yeah. Um, while at the same time, you know, also living within a field that wants to borrow from the strength of the lived experience of having struggle, but not wanting to honor or accommodate or even feel inconvenienced by looking at how you might have contributed to the reason that that strength has to be there in the first place. Yes. And and so you you kind of, I think as a disabled person, even more so if there's intersectionality, if you're also, mm -hmm. you know, a person of color, if you're a female identifying, you know, on and on and on, where you start to feel mind, like I want to pick through you and find the parts of you that inspire me, but I don't want to have to know the parts that makes me feel harder or make me feel convicted or make me feel uncomfortable. Uh, and and you, you, you end up walking around kind of like a segmented orange, you know, picked over and, and, and just the parts that looked most appetizing or what's consumed. Absolutely. Like that was just um, real, right? Like a real conversation. I love that you said that because I, I do have to share that as an immigrant, I'm like, I'm not going to hide anymore. As an immigrant and as a female, I want to have these conversations. And now 
even now having having to deal with so many medical issues since last year um, and now having to deal with disabilities. Now I'm just pissed. Like I used to have to hide myself before because you were not comfortable with me having an accent and being an immigrant and me telling you there's all these things that are not being accommodated when we are doing therapy. And now with all these things that I'm dealing with, I'm like, you're not going to dictate what are, what is my capacity. You're not going to dictate what I can do. You're not going to dictate what parts of me you get to choose. And I love how in this, which no one gets to see because everyone is going to hear it, like our smiles like and nodding. And I was like, <laughs> you do not get to dictate and project onto me. I get to be me. And if you're going to be with me, it's all these parts that come with. But yeah. that idea that you're not comfortable, well, welcome to the club. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. I love that. I know my own experience. I mean, being as translucent as one can be, uh, you know, and I, I checked all the boxes in my early life, right? Like white, middle class, heterosexual, like I fit, I fit in their box perfectly um, until I didn't. Mm -hmm. Right. So I have this weird experience of, oh, oh, now I'm othered when I was, you know, the chosen group before. Um, and so being able to to own that, right, Liliana, like you said, like get in my shoes and be like, mm, mm, mm hmm, yes, I may not check all your boxes anymore, but that does not diminish me yeah. and my contributions. Mm -hmm. Um and also using my privilege to like open those doors and have these conversations. Yeah. So part of our conversations, right, between the three of us, not only because we're going to do this keynote engine, but also is, hey, can we talk about what does it look like to have a dynamic disability? Because we live in an able, um, able, able work and, and they're so used to like, you should be doing this. You should be working 40 hours. Uh, 60 hours. You should attend school and trainings. You should be able to get up and sit down like I, I can't. I just can't. But you should be able to get up and sit down and run and follow the kid. Like <laughs> That's not going to happen anymore. Uh, <laughs> I'm going to be out of breath. <laughs> um, you, you, all these shoots that they're being projected. And then when they call you so that you can talk about this shared experience as you were sharing, Marshall, they're like, these are good points yet they're not being integrated. Research has not catch up to this yet. And yeah. this share experience that according to you, you're valuing, um, you tend to like for five seconds, you're like, oh my God. And then boom, it's gone. Yeah. I'm wondering how many people even know what the term dynamic disability means. Because okay. I'm, I'm sometimes don't know what the... Um, abled world even is aware of it, do y'all have a sense that that's a known idea I'm about to no. go to a meeting where I'm gonna have to teach a system what does that mean so yeah it's gonna be fun uh because no they don't know we don't know no, it's a constant it's a constant learning I don't even think I don't even think my own medical providers use that term Mm -mm. Right. Like it is it is not a well-known term. I think invisible illness is a little bit more well-known and, and more commonplace um, than dynamic. Um, but what it, how do you use dynamic disability, Marshall? What does that mean for you, for those that don't know? To, to me, it, it involves that the level of impairment or the type of need changes moment to moment, day to day, season to season, that you might have, um, you know, days where you wake up and you're more mobile yeah. um, than you were the day before, as one example, mm -hmm. um, but then it changes again the next day. Um, or it might be that your mobility um, is a little bit more fluid on one day, but that is impacting your mood in a new problematic way. And so that, you know, mind and body also don't track at the same dynamic rate. Um, so it's this fluidity of um, struggle and ability. Um, and often it gets um, these kind of microaggressive um, judgments assigned to them so that when you're in a day of maybe moving better, people assumes people assume then that that is the experience you would prefer. 
and that that just makes everything generally better. And then, then all parts of you feel better because you're moving better. And um, when I didn't, I didn't use my cane for something um, last week. And someone said, I noticed you don't have your cane. And I was like, yeah, I wasn't needing today. And they're good for you. You know, oh, that, that is kind of that, um, as my disability is dynamic, I, I get exposed to the implicit bias more and more of people who see the states of my body and mind as some parts being preferred and other parts being not. Um, and, and so that's, that's what it means to me. I wonder about the two of you. Um, I love that you say day, right? For me, it can be like, I can work on, on the morning, in the afternoon, I'm done. Or I'll struggle in the morning and then later uh, in an hour or in the afternoon, like I, I can do things. Uh, but even that disability of being, I'm going to use the term invisible disability, um, for my circle, they know that I use an oxygen machine even, and even when I travel. Well, I'm now being dictated where I can sit because of that portable oxygen machine. I cannot sit where I want to, where I choose, where I pay. The airline gets to dictate where I sit without justification because every time that I ask, they're like, mm. I was like, mm, there's a loss of coming, isn't it? <laughs> uh, for different reasons. But um, for me, it, it was even that understanding that most people, if I said I have uh, chronic anemia, and I'll, I'll, I'll share that piece, um, sometimes my tiredness comes in with tensions and I cannot move. Um, I rely on so many medical treatments in order for me to manage this. I need so many medical procedures in order to help me with this. Things that most people do not have access to this information because I don't believe that everyone has access to me and I should not be sharing everything of me. Um, but when it comes to, for example, to chronic anemia, comes with being tired all the time. Um, yet um, comments from doctors or from colleagues with good intentions, which is, but you look amazing today. That also does not help me. So my day is dictated by not only my mind and my mood, but also what is happening internally that I don't get to see unless we do blood work every day, which I'm also tired of doing blood work every day in order to find out um, what is how my body is going to dictate what I can do today. Yeah, and I love that, Marshall. I, I think mine is in line with yours as well uh, in terms of that it is fluid um, and that it's not, you know, a, a stagnant stale, like I broke my leg this is like the course of treatment for my leg to get better. And then once my leg is better, my leg is better. <clears throat> it, you know, the dynamic disabilities is you might perceive me yeah. uh, having energy and doing all these wonderful things um, and then uh, disappearing to recoup uh, and recover. Um, and I know from my early days in dealing with this, um, getting some backlash of like, what do you mean you can't come out? You were just out with so-and-so. Is this me? You don't want to hang out with me? Yeah. Uh, you don't want to do this thing with me? And it's like, well, no, I was okay to do those things. Today is a different, it's almost like living in a different body today. It's not functioning in the same way. Yeah. Um, and so having to, you know, start, you know, my journey was younger uh, back when I was going out at night. Uh, you know, it was like that. That's where it started for me. And as I've gotten older and aged and, and settled into this dynamic disability body, being able to say, like, I know that this is disappointing. Um, I'm happy to reach out when I feel like I can do this thing with you. Um, and that's not that's not easy to also hear on the other end. There's a lot of social pressure I think, um, and just discomfort, right? Like nobody wants to hear uh, that you're not okay, right? We That's why we have pleasantries. How are you? I'm fine, even though you're not. Yeah, but I think I love the conversation this, right? Because then it turns into the other individual personalize it as it's them um, versus what we're sharing or systems feeling like when we share this, feeling like they're criticized. So they cannot listen anymore into what we're suggesting because they subscribe to something. They're not willing to be open and do adaptations because they don't have the capacity or the share experience to understand what we're saying. 
So even that, right? Like for me, this is new and I've been so vocal about it because I'm like, I'm not the only one. I supervise. I'm listening to the feel and everyone is dealing with something, but no one is talking about it. Why? Mm -hmm. Do you have an answer? A shame. <laughs> Oh, there's a lot of shame because we go to a system such as education that is telling us is your job to be available is your job to attend because if not it's abandonment is your like it's all these ideologies that they have in order for these systems to be accredited so they have to follow that protocol and then we go into pre-licensure and we're so eager to be licensure that we let go of our needs in order to fulfill those requirements. So even like the board um, is, um, you know, systemically that's that's also an issue. <laughs> and then when we get licensure, cause they were like, as soon as I get licensed, I'm gonna have freedom. BS, uh, it gets worse, right? So there's a lot of shame because we don't talk about it and we're not, humanize and normalize these conversations mm -hmm. in regards to can we talk about the human in front of you and from a cultural perspective because I'm getting to know that human what is it that this person needs in front of me and how am I going to adjust um we don't do that not from a therapist client perspective and we don't do that from a therapist to therapist perspective because mm -hmm. what is wrong with you you're supposed to be okay if not, yeah. go, right? Because from an ethical perspective, if not, go, because you're not good to us, because you're not producing. Is that okay that I say that out loud? Oh, it's very good. I, I I can even trace back in my journey the, the so much of the escalation, uh, it, it, at least part of my theory, is just, I, it's unprovable. And some of my symptoms and struggles were the early part of the career when there was so much pressure to get hours and a, you know, a set amount of time. And so I was overworking, which was creating issues on my body because we're like, you know, when you're working with children, you're up and down off the ground and all day long and it's so physical. And so I was then needing more medical treatments and which I couldn't afford because you're, even though you're working all the time as an intern, you get paid almost nothing. So I would pick up another shift or another job just to afford the treatment, which would cause me to need more treatment. And the cycle created a years long um, set of struggles that I can, you know, largely trace back to, um, you know, that that dynamic that, that we just inherited as a paradigm within this field. Uh, and it's not it's not just a paradigm, it's some of the set parameters. In order to get this license, this clock is ticking yeah. and it doesn't matter your body or your need um that you you have you know a set amount of time uh, and so i i don't know that i've ever had easy answers to what's going to be required to introduce true health yeah into our profession i i do know more more vulnerability you know more tolerance of hard conversations um, practices that are more fluid and adjustable to the person you know removing stigma creating spaces that are comfortable for all bodies. And I mean, we, there are many, many things that we need to do. And I also get overwhelmed sometimes about how are we ever going to make any kind of lasting change when the systems that have power that kind of regulate all that we do are usually not run by anybody who's actually a mental health professional. Thank so then you're also having to talk to other people who speak different languages and so I, I just collapse sometimes. Um, then I have these conversations where some energy comes back well, to yeah. me. I don't, I'm, I'm vacillating wildly, even as I try to figure out how to exist in, within this greater profession. Yeah, I think it's, you know, and it's, I think it's more mind boggling for me that it's happening in our field, that, you know, we're a helper based field. Um, we know the the intricacies and the complexities that are human beings um, and how, you know, events in their life can certainly change the trajectory of them. And yet in our own field, we don't give that same grace and kindness to the professionals. And Liliana, you said like you, you would use the word adjust. And, and in my mind, I was like, why we, Right with with dynamic disabilities of of any gender of like underneath that rainbow, um, we adjust 
all the time to fit in these boxes. Why, why is it on us when it is so much easier for those without dynamic disabilities to adjust, to accommodate, to make space? Um, and I know that that, you know, saying that out loud, I'm like, well, that's been systems issues since like the dawn of time. Uh, so of course it's not fixed yet, Maria. <laughs> I, I, yeah. It stresses people out. I think people are afraid of the subject matter. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I read a, a disability um, a piece one time that, that said something about the concept of disability and a disabled person represents an inherent threat, you know, to the abled world. That, that if you are a male identifying person and you're wanting to work on your internalized sexism, you're not having to contend with the fact that one day you will be forced to become a female, mm -hmm. right? And so it's a little more philosophical, yeah. um, even though it's hard and even though it's work, um, the thing about trying to work on your internalized ableism is you're, you're, you also have awareness that your body has a clock yeah. and it, it will change and your mind will shift in capacity and so it's you're not doing it in this vacuum you're not trying to have those conversations hypothetically you start having to make contact with your own future yeah. Yeah. that's hard to sit with yeah. Yeah. and that's part of like the conversations right that we're having privately um, from like, how are we preparing? How exhausting it is having to explain, describe, justify, fit in, constantly adjust. You know, as you guys were talking, I was like, since I've been in this country, I've been asked to adjust in order to assimilate, which that's what we're discussing in order to fit in. And I bought into the idea because as an immigrant, it's like, this is what you have to do. Um, as I'm getting older or seasoned, because that's the word that we love in our field, I'm like, I don't want to adjust anymore. I want to be me. If we're truly talking about nervous systems and God knows that now everyone is on this board, let's talk about the nervous system. Um, and we all are talking about um, cultural humility, cultural opportunity, especially since COVID and George Floyd. We're just making noise. Can we say that? We love feeling like, uh, oh, yes, I know this. Or, oh, yes, we're doing this. But it's just making noise. That's what it is at the end of the day. And I think that's where I go back to you, Marshall, which is it is exhausting. Um, it takes me time once I come out and I talk about this. It takes me time to recharge because I just want to go crawl and cry, realizing it's exhausting having to have a voice. What you call resilient or brave takes a lot from me. And why are you requiring me to be brave and talk about this? It's not that I'm asking for easier, but don't be an ass. <laughs> Is that okay? Yeah. <laughs> yes. I love how you're asking permission. This is our space, Liliana. <laughs> Everything is, a, that's why we created this space. <laughs> and I think that's why this conversation is, is so important because prior really to my connection with Liliana, I didn't have anybody else in my professional world that I knew was going through anything similar to me. So I didn't feel like I could talk about how I am struggling in my profession because of my body. Um, and I know, Marshall, you are kind of the unintended and probably unwanted poster child when it comes to talking about ableism in our field. But thank you for doing this and and hoping that someone else is listening going, oh, I'm not, I'm not alone in what I'm going through. And it's not fair to put it on you, Marshall. No. Okay. Yeah. But I, yeah, I, I appreciate it. I, I let, you know, I, I pretend that the only people who know my name are people that I've told my name to. Um, <laughs> I think we all kind of, in this field, we start to realize, um, especially if you're someone who does some teaching or some speaking, that of course there are people out there that you don't know that know a bit about you. And part of the the strangeness of that is I, I, I do feel 
the honor and and the opportunity about getting to speak to things, but it also creates this um, this strange dynamic of um, the kind of vulnerability that you're displaying by maybe sharing part of your story or advocating for something isn't a reciprocal one. And so you're not getting this mutual vulnerability back. And 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 so it it's this ironic and a little sad um, dynamic of you get more and more isolated even as you become more and more honest. Yeah. Uh, and and I don't I don't know the the solution to that because I don't think that happens only to therapists who um, teach or speak or write. You know, I think that that that's happening. Um, even if you spend, you know, your time behind a door, um, this, when people start knowing a thing about you and they start considering, oh, you're a resource in this area, especially it's an area that I don't want to have to think about. So I like having you over there doing that. Uh, it it's strangely um, alienating, um, while still moving in a direction that feels welcome. And I, I don't always know how to make sense of, of what's unfolding, which as you both know, is why I go underground from time to time and I just hide and I just don't respond to anybody. Yeah. Like I just, I did it like the text messages of, I can't handle blue dots. I can't handle numbers. So I just click them and they look red and I'm like, no, that's going to be a few weeks. I'll dig out later, but I, I, I don't know how to always exist um, in a world where people know more about my body than my spirit. Um, and it starts to feel a, a little um, unequal. Yeah. Yeah. And it goes back to where we started of this. Well, you look so good, right? Your physical appearance is the only thing I am judging your well being on. Um, and that is so flat and and you know and it's it takes away a bit of our humanity is like that's not that's not the only thing about me that's not the only indicator of my well-being and as we know in this profession you know we can even look back at like you know robin williams comes to mind you know examples of depression that do not fit what people think about when it looks like depression yeah. And I think that that is very similar to what we see with these dynamic disabilities. It's like, well, if I can't see the D on your forehead, then you must be fine. Yeah. yeah. Ooh. yeah. So I'm wondering, as we're coming to the end of this, which I keep, wish I could keep going, and I know that there's other stuff to come up because <laughs> we're starting the fire. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> I'm wondering, uh, what will be a takeaway um, one that you took from this conversation or a uh, takeaway that you want to give to our listeners who would like to start? Oh, I thought that was all Marshall. I was going to let him go. <laughs> <laughs> I, I do have a couple of things that come to mind. Um, one is um, it's okay. Like be direct, ask questions, be curious. You know, someone asked me, a couple of weeks ago, um, it kind of hesitantly and almost tearfully, uh, they said, is it okay? I, I, I don't know, is your illness terminal? And I, I just don't know when, while I'm getting to know you, you know, how to, how to prepare for, for interacting with you and in, in your illness. And, and I was like, Oh, it, it's not that we can start there. And, and, and everyone is terminal, but, but we'll pretend like the, the, this illness is not known to, to be the thing that's going to kill me. Um, but it's also a complicated question because of secondary complications. And and to be honest with you, it was one of the most delightful, just to someone to have a respectful way to say, I would like to know this part of you when you're comfortable talking about it. But the other takeaway is at the same time, you know, don't necessarily always use a person who has a struggle as your primary source of getting information about that. Um, you know, feel, go go do some reading and and don't just consume, but then digest, you know, touch base into your own biases, you know, clear out your own closet, um, you know, before then trying to get to know that part of someone else. The, the, there, there are some respectful ways to enter into knowing more about this and none of them 
um, can avoid a path of you having to sit with your own level of awareness for what you've inherited in, in the culture and the world that you were raised in. Yeah. Oh God. I love that. I love that. And I just kind of the, you need to sit with yourself and do the work to make space before you can ask for more information. Um, and that's a tall order. That's a tall ask of somebody. Uh, we, we are societally, uh, shift we shift away from that right like oh that's that's hard work and uncomfortable no thank you um I love that I love that and you were you were talking so my takeaway um because, because it, those of you listening know that I'm a nerd um what came to my mind was Ted Lasso's be curious not judgmental mm-hmm. I'm gonna have that tattooed across my if I could have a tattoo, yes, because I'm not allowed to do tattoos anymore. <laughs> um, oh, I love those two. I was like, oh, should we end there? Um, I will say for me is, please, when I'm sharing with you, do not take it personal. This is not about you. If you're asking to know about me, can you let go of that ego? Um, I'm not a library. <laughs> you can always go to Google. Um. I love to share, but I do not always have the capacity to share. Um, and stop making comments about my appearance. Yeah. Um, what I look like does not define, um, I wish it would, but does <laughs> not define how I feel or the yeah. capacity that I have. When I go high, it's not just because I'm an introvert, but it's because I'm going to need recuperation time. And I should not have to justify to you why I need to go rest. You should not dictate what is my energy level or what I can do. I have enough. Do not tell me, do not take that on. Do not personalize it. So obviously, if you see me in public, do not talk to me because you're going to get one of this. Go with someone who's more gentle. But if this what if this sparked a fire for you, come join us in June um, or the next time we have Marshall because Marshall will have to come back. We are not, 30 minutes was not enough time. <laughs> I look forward to it. And it would be fun to have more and more people at the at the conference in June, at the Mid-Atlantic um, conference where we know there there's a group of people ready to engage. Yeah. Uh, that would be, it would be a lovely moment to have for our field. Yeah, we're gonna have a dynamic disability gang startup. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Jackets and everything. <laughs> I was just thinking, I'd be the one making the scrapbook for the gang. <laughs> I'm so hot. My pink lady jackets. It's gonna be a whole thing. <laughs> Gangs have historians. Can that be my job? <laughs> yes, granted. <laughs> oh my god. <laughs> With that, I, I hope you really join us because we're gonna have a blast as you can get the feeling from from this conversation. So thank you, Marshall, for being here. I cannot wait to do this again. And I know the three of us feel supported because the three of us keep talking about these conversations. So the invitation for all of you who are listening is, please be curious about your colleagues. Let's start this conversation because it's not just us. We're just a friendship fraction of what is happening in our field. And then advocate, please advocate to all these systems who are not listening to us as we, as we keep advocating, help us with that. It should not just be us. So until next time, um, hope you join us again. And again, Marshall, thank you, thank you, thank you for being you. you and for um, helping us with this conversation. Thanks for having me. Bye. Bye.